Uh, when they assign a subject like this, uh, they must think that you are an expert in dislocations. Fortunately, we don't really see very much, particularly with the direct anterior. So I'll go through the uh, literature and try to sort of give an overall algorithm for prevention of infection. Infection is rare, fortunately, after total hip replacement, about 1 to 5 percent. But it can be very common after revisions, occurring up to 30 to 40 percent. Majority of infections after hip replacement are fortunately single dislocations, and they can be conservatively treated without surgery. The factors that affect dislocation include patient demographics, surgical approach, and implant geometry. Those that occur early, they happen as a result of component malpositioning, abductor insufficiency, and pay probably patient noncompliance, and possibly trauma. The late dislocations are usually as a result of polyethylene wear, which has fortunately gone away very much with that uh, highly crossing polyethylene, unrecognized component malpositioning, deterioration in neurological stats of the patient, such as strokes, etc., and then again trauma. So what are the options available? Large femoral head, great trochanter advancement, which is not done very often these days, bipolar and tripolar, constraint liners, and I think dual mobility, I would say that that's probably one of the most popular options at the moment, and in my opinion, a great option for patients with recurrence and stability. The most effective strategy in prevention of recurrent dislocation is repositioning of malpositioned components. But you have to remember that the malpositioning of components can sometimes be subtle, and unless you're looking for it, you may not see it. Uh, this is a uh, patient dislocation like this. It's very easy because you can see that the components are very uh, abnormally malpositioned, or this revision case, uh, recurrent dislocation, clearly that's a very vertical cup, high, high inclination. But a patient like this presenting with instability, you may not at first sight notice the component malpositioning in, the, in this particular patient. And some of these patients may require additional imaging, such as CT scan, to assess the retroversion of the astabular component, possibly the version of the uh, femur as well. So when I see a recurrent instability, I look at the femoral side and I look at the astabular side. On the femoral side, I want to see if the offset has been restored and if the position of the femoral component is normal. On the acetabular side, I look at the orientation of the acetabular component and its position. One of the telltale signs is if a patient presents with limb length discrepancy, that's usually a concerning sign for instability. Usually that means the patient, the surgeon ran into problems during surgery, such as here with that vertical inclination and continuing to increase their limb length with the use of that skirted femoral head, etc. And that's obviously not going to fix the problem. You need to fix the problem by repositioning that acetabular component. So whenever a patient presents with limb length discrepancy and subluxation or dislocation, I can almost guarantee that that's a malpositioned component that you need to reposition. On the femoral side, very important to look at offset. Not all patients have the same offset. We have varus necks, we have valgus necks, and if you don't restore that offset, it's likely the patient will run into problem. So here, for example, there's a valgus neck needing different type of neck cut and different type of component positioning. And here's a varus neck where, you, again, you need to give the patient the anatomical offset they had, and if they don't, they will run into problem. Sometimes to assess offset in a case like this where this is auto ankylosed patient, is difficult, so you have to guess that intraoperatively by removing that uh, HO and then repositioning that component to try to give them the appropriate offset. All of you in this room know the reason for offset. That's obviously the stre uh, stretch of the abductor mechanism, and soft tissue stability is very important for total hip. So the position of the astabular component, how do you assess? I usually like to see the central femoral head to be at the same level or just slightly above the tip of greater trochanter. That's probably proper positioning. The second thing is I want to see the astabular component seated against the teardrop. Not below or above, but against the teardrop. So here's a patient where you see that the offset is 
is probably okay, but the positioning of the Astabra component may not be optimal. And it's important to remember that when you're looking at inclination of these, you need to also be aware of the uh, version of the femoral component. So on the astabular side, again, look for instability in secondary uh, limb length discrepancy. On the AP radiograph, you can measure the inclination of the cup fairly easily, and there are now better softwares for measuring the version of the astabular component also, but also look to see where the astabular component is positioned. Look at the astabular component here, really low, and that's clearly going to lead to limb length discrepancy, and that's probably vertical inclination, and that patient is going to run into problem. By repositioning that astabular component in the appropriate place, perhaps you will address the instability in this particular patient. So if you have instability, what do you do? First is I like to see the preoperative radiographs of the hip to see what their offset was, or at least compare it to the contralateral side if that hasn't been uh, replaced. Scrutinize the component positioning, both on the acetabular and on the femoral side and be prepared to revise the well-fixed component that's malpositioned. So you need to look to make sure that the component is in good position. First, you need to test the position of the cup, remove the screws in order to be able to do it, test the stability. To remove the poly, I usually put a very quick uh, screw on the uh, edge of the liner. You put a screw and that pops the liner out. Then you remove the, the screws that are inside the acetabulum in order to assess its position and also assess for stability. Very critical to make sure that you have proper positioning of the component before you move into the next step. If the cup is loose, obviously you revise. If it's well fixed or malpositioned, but malpositioned, you revise it, except in the very elderly and frail patients you may get away with the use of dual mobility or constraint liner, but only in frail and elderly patients. Don't try to cut corners because if you do, unfortunately, you will not be able to address the patient's problem. To remove a well-fixed component, you can use the explant system. I don't personally like it. I use the curved osteotomes and then you have special instruments that you're able to pull the socket out and at this point, you can easily reposition the component without any bone loss. If you have a well-fixed and well-positioned component and you have an identifiable cause for instability, you would correct it. The only exception here would be infection. So here, if you have an identifiable cause, you will address it. If you have no identifiable cause and you think this is as a result of abductor mechanism insufficiency, then you have the option of using a constraint liner or you can use dual mobility. But not every cup accepts dual mobility and some of, some of the time you have to be prepared to remove a well-fixed cup in order to use dual mobility. But if the patient is old and you have a good large size cup, I usually tend to put its uh, constraint liner into the socket if you can. If you cannot put a constraint liner because of the lock mechanism, you can always cement a constraint liner into a well-fixed acetabular component and position it such that it's not going to dislocate. In uh, patients that have abductor deficiency or unknown etiology for uh, dislocation and they have failed multiple prior operations, I tend to use constraint lining. But only in that circumstances, I will use constraint liner. And constraint liners have fairly high success rates in terms of addressing the stability. And if you're going to be using a constraint liner, it's better to use it against a well-fixed component. If you feel you have to use a constraint liner with a newly placed acetabular component, first of all, make sure you get an excellent uh, press fit of the acetabular component. Then you have to put multiple screws into that acetabular component, preferably uh, use a multi-hole and put as many screws as you can against the bone. And then if you use a constraint liner in that situation, I would usually ask the patient to remain non-weight bearing, avoid any type of activities for a period of six weeks to allow that acetabular component to grow in. Because obviously constraint liner is going to affect that uh, situation. 
If you have a well-fixed cup and you have a lock and mechanism that accepts a constraint liner, you can put a snap fit. If not, again, you can cement it. And cementing a constraint liner into the socket has very good track record. There are some tricks about the uh, cementing it. First of all, remove, remove the ring around the constraint liner. Score the back of the acetabular component with use of a burr and then score the actual uh, uh, acetabular component as well in the metal so that you get as good of a cement fix as possible. Use the cement when it's doughy and apply as much of the cement to the back of it and then press fit, wait for cement to harden. It does increase wear and reduces motion. Constraint liners lead to failures, some of which are catastrophic, including pelvic discontinuity, for example, here. So because of that, my preference now is to use dual mobility and recurrence and stability. It has excellent track record addressing recurrence and stability based on some new studies that come out. And I think dual mobility perhaps is the best option in these patients. So in closing, I think instability fortunately is uncommon. Dual mobility appears to be very promising for recurrence and stability. Constraint liner has good success, but needs to be used in very, very rare cases. But the best way to prevent dislocation is to do the operation well in the first place.